which we agreed that today will not be additional lectures, but it will be an um, exercise session. So we start by asking you if you want some particular thing explained, understood, you know, you can ask a question, how do you do this? And uh, then I may be able to answer, I may not be able to answer, but we can try. Okay. Yes. Oh, I thought I'd be swamped with all kinds of questions. Yes. Can you explain the? Okay, very good. The idea is the following. Uh, in the BTW model or more generally in these kinds of sand pile models you add grains and there are some avalanches and eventually the grains leave the system and you keep on adding and they keep on leaving. Okay? So we ask for what is the probability of there are S toplings or some event of size S. Okay? And uh, what I would like to argue is that the expectation value of number of toplings has to diverge as the size of the system goes to infinity. Okay? If this is true, then it immediately, so if then you define, this is probability of S for a given size, then probability of S L usually is a function like this. Initially this is log probability divided by log S. Initially it kind of decays, usually it's like some power, but there is a cutoff. Okay? But if you let L go to infinity, then the power law goes on for much longer. So we define probability of S L limit as L goes to infinity equal to probability of S. If this limit exists, usually it does. You know, like even if you take the large size limit, the probability that you will get no toppling when you add something is finite. Probability that you will get exactly one toppling is finite. So this prob S exists even for even when L is very large and it is finite for each finite S. Then the question is, is it a power law? So the claim is that the first moment of this has to be infinite. Because what is the proof? The proof is that suppose you take very large number, suppose you take L, L is a finite number, 100 by 100 or some such thing. And I keep on adding grains and they keep on leaving. Okay, so I add one trillion grains one after another, and in each case I measure the amount of toppling done. Then I can label the grains as eventually each grain will be added at some time and it will leave at some time. So I ask how many topplings this this grain undergo. The number of topplings one particular grain undergoes is going to in increase with L, as at least as L or typically as L squared. Okay? So if the number of toplings incurred by each grain is going to diverge, then the average number of toplings per grain will also be the same, it will also diverge. Okay? The proof is precisely this number of toplings per grain
average number is equal to number of top links per avalanche. Actually, there is a factor here by 4 because each top link causes in an avalanche when I count one top link, 4 grains count it, I got toppled, I got toppled, I got toppled like that. Okay? So, if I take the sample of all the trillion grains I added, I will get so many top links were done. Okay? Then I say per grain how many top links were done. Each top link in an avalanche will count as each of the grains will say I got toppled, I got toppled on that one. Right? So, the number of top links per avalanche, per grain added. Average number of top links found by one grain. Not found, number of top links undergone. by a marked grain. Okay? So, this number is clearly infinite and hence this number is infinite. Once this number is infinite, then the probability <laughs> of the, um, this probability S, the first moment must diverge. Probe S S summation over S is equal to infinite. So, it is a power law. Okay? Clearly, I have not used any properties of the particular toppling rule of the sand pile. So, it is a very robust argument. The only point which we have used is that if you add a grain, it keeps on moving, but it can only leave at the boundary, it cannot disappear in the middle. If the grain disappears in the middle, then this argument does not work because the argument said that it has to move order L in order to disappear, right? That argument will not work if there is dissipation in the bulk, not only dissipation at the boundary. Okay. Sorry. The number of toppings undergone by a market grain is it in, uh, in one avalanche? Or no, in the, the till it side? leaves. From the time it is added till the time it leaves. No, it is not living in one avalanche. So, it is a flip of the, you are counting number of toplings, but in two different ways. One is per grain and one is per avalanche, but you should get the same answer. Sorry. The size, yeah. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. That went as L squared or as, you know, the, the bound that this number is greater than order L is a much more robust bound. It does not even use the fact that the paths of grains are random walks. Okay. So you just add it anywhere. It has to take order L steps in order to leave. Okay. 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 So we said. So I I had this file, and I keep on adding grain. Grain number one, grain number two, grain number three. All grain and grains are marked, and all of them leave eventually. So I add how many grains? How many toplings were encountered by grain one, grain two, grain three? Let us call them. E1 plus E2 plus E3 plus E trillion, whatever, E total number of grains added. But this will be compared with S1 plus S2 plus S3, which is the number of toplings on adding the first grain, number of toplings on adding the second grain, and so on. But these two numbers have to be equal uh, up to a multiplicative constant.
sorry, I beg your pardon, I think there is a mistake here. It is multiplied by 4, not divided by 4. E1, E2 is the number of toplings encountered by grain 1 till it leaves. E2 is the number of toplings encountered by grain 2 till it leaves, and so on. And this is number of toplings on adding the first grain, number of toplings on adding the second grain, like that. So I'm just counting all the number of toplings in two different ways. I'm rearranging the summation. And um, so that is what it is. OK? Is the proof clear? OK. Yes? OK. So there is some, I guess for me right now I will write um, the con configuration will be given by the um, heights, no? so the heights will be 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, whatever some heights. And the heights are written in the centers of squares. OK? Uh, they, those are my cells. Usually, we will discuss this in the, um, you know, there is a square and the vertices are where the height should be. So I should write 3 here, and 2 here, and 1 here, and not in the centers. I think this issue is important. But we will stick to this one. The, I like this easier to draw, no? Because I write three in the middle of the square. Okay. Uh, so then, what we have agreed, which we will not show now, is that there is a burning test, which says that if you try to imagine that outside is all burnt, and then you burn any site whose height is equal to or bigger than the number of unburnt neighbors. And if everything burns, then you are in the recurrent state. Okay? So I start by this that I this stuff is all burnt outside, or the sink site outside is considered as burnt. This is the sink site. Now what does what can be burnt in this one? Let us take three, two, two, three. One, one, two, two, two. Um, one, two, three. Two, one, one, two, one, one, one. Too many ones, but okay. Now, I burn this. This side can be burned because it has only two unburnt neighbors and uh, its height is three. So I, I would be typically burning this first. And uh, what else can I burn? Right now, nothing. In this graph, nothing else can be burned. But now, as soon as I come here, then this site has height 2, but it has two unburnt neighbors. So in the next stage, I can burn this. Once I have burned this, then I can burn this. And then I can burn this. Right? No, no, sorry, I beg your pardon, not this one. Two. Okay, so I'm stuck. So this was not a recurrent configuration. What is left behind is a forbidden configuration. 
This one, because it has three unburnt neighbors, so right now I cannot burn it. Aha, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. You are right, of course. Mm, so I, I should burn this one. Once I burn this one, then this will also burn. And now, this one below, and the one above, and then this one as well, and then this one as well, and then this one as well, and then that seems like it. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay, and this one. Oh, this one in the second row on the left. One again. One again. This one also? All right. No, 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 very good. So, they, they, depending on the configuration, they will burn. But you see, there is a sequence in which they burn. So, now I will draw the path the fire took in order to get there. Yes, please. Zero to three. So ah. where, when it says larger, we can go. Okay. Translate it to larger or equal. Okay, very good. So uh, there was, uh, there has been sort of um, flip flop in the notation, and uh, so one convention is that the heights go from one to four, and the other convention is heights go from zero to three. In this case, the toppling rule is that if height is greater than 4, then topple. And here the rule is that if height is greater than or equal to 4, then topple. Okay? So we agreed that these two are actually equal. There is no big deal. You just have to redefine h prime equal to h minus 1, and then both the rules are actually the same. Okay? But the burning rule can also be phrased either in terms of h prime or in terms of h. Okay? And in terms of h prime, there is one burning rule. In terms of h, there is a slightly different burning rule. One of them says that burn only if everything, if the height is bigger than the number of unburnt neighbors. The other says if it is bigger than or equal to unburned neighbors. Okay, so that is a comment. It's not a, just remember that different, when, suppose somebody defines the model like this, then he will use one version. If he defines the model like this, he will use the other version. Okay, so now in our case, we found that the fire went like this, and then it went here, and then it went here, and then it went here, and then. Uh, yeah, then it went here, and this fire went from here to here, and from outside it went here, and it went here and here, and then it went here, and it went here, and so on. Okay? So, once, once a site is burnt, then it can burn, the fire can propagate from there. So, if everything burnt, then I just draw this path of fire burning, and it will burn everything. And let's not write these heights, and it will burn everything in some way. So the burning path defines a spanning tree. Is this? Yes, please. Uh, in this case, it seems to that every time the, the burning path, uh, uh, it, each square that we, uh, that we burn yeah. can come only from uh, 100 squares. Hmm. So and from already burned squares. Yeah. Because if yeah. Not, uh, we can have cycles. Yeah. So that point where we, we merge like the bottom one yeah. with the top one, yeah. it's, it's, not, uh, it's not possible. Very good. No, no, no. So the basic philosophy is that the burning path corresponds to a spanning tree. This much is true. Now, 
is there a one to one correspondence between burning paths and spanning trees that is the question you have to ask each burning path will be a spanning tree because i only burned once each site is burnt only once so it's a tree all sides are burnt <coughs> so it's a spanning tree now we have to ask is there a one to one correspondence between these that's a little bit trickier and so what we have to do is to realize that oh if this side burns then the height could be 2 or 3 and it will still burn so maybe there is no one to one correspondence between the burning paths and trees but no there is actually because you can burn either from here or from here so any site which burns i can say that the fire came from one of its already burnt neighbors which one we will have to choose i have some choice but the choice is exactly equal to the height allowed at that site okay so i make up some rule saying if the um, height is maximum then burn from this side if the height is less than that burn from this side and so on and then there is a unique height association with the burning path once i have chosen decided that if the height is 3 then i'll burn from here if the height is 2 i'll burn from here now when i give you a burning path you will immediately know what is the height configuration because of my ex extra rules i had it okay so in the burning test we didn't actually tell you have to mm, burn from this side burn from that side we just said burn but if you want to make a one to one correspondence you add this extra bit and you say burn from this side burn from this side and then there is a one to one correspondence between the burning paths and spanning uh, and the height configurations is that clear okay anything else yes no because uh, this path you know the fire comes like this fire comes like this at this point one side gets burnt but i will decide whether to say that it burnt from top or from bottom not yeah. but from not from both okay. okay so then there is no possibility of a loop yes sir sorry and i can you say that the um, uh, the burning path is not because given a per configuration which i know burns i just decide i just draw the path of the fire okay there is a construction see the point is there are two sets they are equal in number you can make any one to one correspondence between them in principle so because you, we know already that they are in equal numbers the number of spanning trees no no actually we we first set up the correspondence then count the number of spanning trees and then say that oh but this must be equal to the other number okay okay, okay? but in the end i am saying the correspondence between the spanning trees and the height configurations take some stupid example this is a 2 by 2 graph there is a spanning tree like this there is a spanning tree like this there is a spanning tree like this there is a spanning tree like uh, this right i can't make any other trees on a square now the height configurations are whatever they are 2 2 1 2 and so on okay now what corresponds to which one you can make any correspondence i can say this height configuration corresponds to this one this height configuration corresponds to this one this one, whatever given two equal sets you can make any one to one correspondence we are making the one which makes our life sort of easy and makes you know because there are big sizes you make a algorithm to make an assignment it's a free choice and we chose the burning test to use the 
Yes, I know. Okay? Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> delta i i is equal to product over j a to the power minus delta i j j not equal to i okay what is the proof of this relation okay this is the question right I rephrase, no, 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 I rephrased your question, but you asked first the original question. Yeah. Uh, assume that delta is... Uh, delta is some funny matrix, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, when you want to see what happens if you add a grain or anything, mm. you see the algorithm if the i is more than the i is yeah. c, mm. and yeah. so on. Precisely. But when you want to uh, write a1 to the power of 7 equals yeah. a2 to the Power of mm. four, mm. I think you uh, see in the columns and write the algorithm. Uh, no, I didn't write any columns, I didn't write any algorithm. Uh, so let us uh, go through this proof. It is important to um, be assured of the argument. So this relation is true for all. Uh, for all configurations with positive heights. Okay? So, suppose there is some configuration or the other, I don't know what it is. I would like, so this is called C, and I would like to know what is A i to the power delta i i acting on c. c is any configuration. Okay? And the statement is that of course you can add one and then topple and then add another and then topple and do all kinds of stuff, but the result will be the same as first I add all of them together and then topple. Even that one, actually c can have some sides which are unstable also, it does not matter. I will now I will say that oh but I am allowed to topple any order I like so first I will topple at i. So the statement is only requires that at site i now that I have added delta i i it must topple. Once it topples this is the same as acting um, minus delta i j particles at j acting on c product over j. End of proof. No, no, no. It should be clear that the argument is only one line argument and it, it imposes, it uses the abelian property. It uses the property that once I add delta i i particles at the site, it must stop it. That's all it uses, nothing else. Okay. How do you, what? How, how, is, how we should uh, find the forbidden configurations? Oh, so uh, forbidden configurations, For but example, we should... you have yeah. a delta, hmm. uh, may you write this delta, I say, uh -huh. uh, delta equals uh, 7. Yeah. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, uh, so the statement... The, the, no, 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 it's very, it's all right. Suppose I am in the config, suppose uh, yeah, my C belongs to R, suppose, assume, suppose. Okay? 
then there is a stronger relation. The stronger relation is that um, product, so let us write it like this. Two one 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 two one 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 two one 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 two zero acting on C is equal to C. It says that take whatever configuration you have, that is the recurrent configuration, add to it this stuff, two here, one here, one here, one here, and double, and see what you get. Then you must get back the recurrent configuration. Okay. If I do not get back the recurrent configuration, okay, then what I do is that suppose I get this acting on C is equal to C prime which is not recurrent. Okay. Then in C prime, there must be, it's, then I look at C and I try to burn it and you will stop, the fire will not reach everywhere then whatever remains is a forbidden configuration. Okay? The forbidden configurations were sort of found first and the burning test was invented later based on generalizing the forbidden configuration. But now you can use the burning test to define whatever the fire cannot burn is a forbidden configuration. Yes, please. Every piece, so you maybe that down, not connected part, every piece is that are from the very, very top and you got small islands, yeah. not connected. Yeah. Every island mm. is right. Is that clear? Yes, please. Again, on the very example of the two by two lattice, yeah. there were four spinning trees. Ah. That is equal Ah, okay, very good. So, mm, the, mm, I think one should distinguish between these two things. There is a spanning tree like this and there is a sink site, which is a sink. Let us draw the sink site like one site. But this site is connected to this one with two bonds and connected to this one with two bonds and connected to this one with two bonds and connected to this one with two bonds. Now I have to draw spanning trees on this bigger graph. That number is 192. Okay? Sorry? That was exactly the question. Okay. If we have a, a different delta matrix, then yeah. uh, it has to do with this graph. With the you have to draw the edges in the suitable way and yeah, yeah everything uh, can be modified, what is the, um, there, there is some Latin word for this, uh, which I have forgotten, but anyway, yeah. Okay, so the proof to so, if there is a forbidden configuration, so you imagine that there is fire outside everywhere and you try to burn it and you won't burn it. You won't be able to reduce any further. So, then it is a forbidden configuration. Okay? Yes, please. Yes. 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 You means you add some grains. Okay, I mean, I, and that is in this language to operate an operator. Yes. I can add any, I can choose any operator from the bigger group. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, uh, by looking, uh, if I keep on uh, operating the operators, hmm. then in steady state, hmm. that's, uh, that, um, I mean, in steady state, the configuration is going to yeah, see, eventually, yeah, yeah, it's a recurrent configuration. Recurrent means comes back again and again. Yeah. Sir, state is the state of this recurrent configuration. 
Yes, yes. Okay. I have explained it three times. Now I let me see. Uh, can we discuss it later? I am saying the proof of the forbidden configurations was that if you don't start with two zeros like this. You will never get there. After. You cannot create this configuration by toppling process. That was the argument. Either it is there in the initial configuration or it won't be there. Because if you try to add something, you will never get zero, zero. Okay? So, once you are in the recurrent... In the initial configuration, you may be starting with everything zero. That is allowed. But as you keep on adding grains, the number of adjacent zeros keeps on decreasing. And this number can never increase. And so eventually they get lost and they are never found again. So in the recurrent states, they don't occur. If you start from recurrent state, then this is never, it's not there. And it cannot be generated. <coughs> okay, yes, please. This is a section about uh, the structure of Abelian group. Yes. There is a statement that says um, that the generator of the cyclic subgroups of the group can be defined as the product of, of a J huh. of I, a J to the B. Yeah. So can you explain a bit of this? Okay. alpha is equal to product over j a j to the power b alpha j right this is what you want to understand okay so firstly this is an operator this much is clear now i want to show that e alpha raised to the power d alpha equal to 1 show is identity operator on the set of recurrent configurations. Okay? So, what is E alpha to the power D alpha? That is equal to product over J, AJ to the power D alpha, B alpha J, right? But, this can be written as equal to product over J DB alpha J A J. D alpha is a big D. We wrote delta is equal to A D B. So, D was a diagonal matrix. So, D B is a, D is a diagonal matrix, then DB is the same as D alpha, B alpha, beta. Okay? So now, but DB is equal to A inverse delta. From the previous equation. So this is equal to product over J, AJ, A inverse delta. Uh, alpha j. Mm. 
Okay? But this can be written as product over J A j to the power delta alpha j a in a j to the delta beta j a inverse alpha beta. Okay, I wrote on the right, but it is the same because I have written indices. So now I don't have to worry about matrix. But this stuff is identity. And so this becomes the whole thing becomes identity. Okay, end of proof. So we define this uh, generator in order to get the identity. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. See, if I have a group element, what power do I raise it to to get identity? If you raise it to enough power, sometime or the other, you will get identity. But these have been constructed so that this one raised to the power d alpha will give me identity, but I have different choices of d alpha and I get different generators and then there is a generator of the abelian group. Okay? Yes, please. This identity as far as I remember it holds it to work in R. Yeah, of course. It's the set of recurrent configurations where the group works. Okay. If the, you know, we are determining the structure of the recurrent group. Okay. So it's only in the recurrent group. Okay. No problem. No other questions. Very good. <laughs> so I made up some questions because I thought maybe you will uh, like to have a sample of the kinds of questions you might be asked. Or you can test your understanding on what you have already understood so far by seeing if you can answer these questions. So for each question, I will ask you, do you think you understand how to answer this? Means maybe you cannot figure out the answer in two, three seconds, but you know how to go around it, given 10 minutes you will be able to work it out or not. If you can answer it, then you say yes, otherwise you say no, then I will sort of have a feeling as to how much of my effort has been successful in communicating some ideas. Okay. So, here is a problem. The problem will be written down here. Okay. So, it says define. Some of the stuff will be written on, said only in words. So, I define a senpai. Uh, with the following rules, on toppling z j goes to z j plus z j one plus z j two plus z j three plus z j four by five. Uh, I didn't write it very well, but let me say it like this. There are this. There is a site. If it says if z is bigger than three, then you just take the average of all these five numbers and give it to each one. Each one gets the average of the five heights. If the height is too big, then you just spread it out equally amongst all the neighbors. The heights are real numbers, not integers. Is the definition of the model clear? But also the, the value of the neighbors is modified? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the toppling process, the value of the neighbors is also modified. Okay? Sorry? Yes, and what is the rule to modify the value of the neighbors? It's precisely the same. All of them get the same value. Okay? You keep on adding until some side becomes bigger than 3, then you top it. Okay? And when something adds, goes to the boundary, then things will leave. Okay? Is the model clear? It is one of like one of those sand pile models. Uh, 
I didn't say it, but yeah, you work with positive numbers. Yeah. Sorry, average and? Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I should say ZJI go to this. All the five neighbors go to that value. Now, yes, sir. How can I be sure that the number of particles that the neighbor will get is integer? No, they are not integers, they are real numbers, I said. Okay? So it is clear, the definition of the model is clear. They are real numbers. They are real numbers. It's not a, yes, please. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You just average and give everybody the average. And on the border? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it says, on the borders, this guy will get some number and it will leave. Initially, the height was zero. Then it gets something, but it is reset to zero. Heights outside are always reset to zero. The definition of the model is clear. Okay. The question is only this. Is this model a billion or not? Neighbors are not getting one, but they might get something, you know. It is? Okay. No, no, no. So, uh, let's not jump to conclusions. How many people think they answer, they know the answer? Just raise your hand. Yeah. The question is, is this model as defined a billion or not? Do you know the answer? I don't know whether it's yes or no, but do you can, can you figure out the answer or you have no clue about what is the answer? That is the question. If you think you know the answer, just raise your hand. A little bit higher so that I can see. I see a substantial class of, substantial set of people have not raised their hand. Okay, so then there is a problem. See, I defined the model clearly. Then I'm asking, is this model a billion or not? Okay. Okay, so we have to check, you know, if the if you add at i, add at j, is this the same result as adding at j and at, at i, you know? That was the test or that was the characteristic. So can I just check it, you know? Can I add this, you know, start with some configuration, add at i, add at j, see what happens. They don't commute. Yeah. No, no, no. So you are able to see or you are able to check that this model is not a billion, that is the answer. Sorry, but uh, uh, if I don't have uh, five uh, particles, uh, what happens? Is we keep on adding, no, no, in that model, in the sand pile, there is no dearth of how sand grains. You keep on adding one after another and you reach the steady state, you keep on adding and so on and so forth. Yes, but the, the node is unstable if I have four uh, it's, grains. Uh, no, no, so in the beginning, there are some configurations where you add, nothing happens. You add here, nothing happens. You add here, nothing happens. So, of course, it is the same. 
But the abelian property requires that for all possible configurations the same thing happens. No, no, but I don't understand the model. Huh. If I have, uh, for example, this, for uh, zero, what happens? So this one will topple now. How? Uh, by, uh, oh, and, and so we said, yeah, so we will imagine that there is a zero here and zero okay. here and zero here and then divide these four equally and then erase all the boundary sides. Yeah, but I don't understand the equally. Four divided by five is a fraction. So I said that it's a real number. We said it thrice. You were not paying attention. Sorry. Okay, I no, no, it's okay. The, the heights are real numbers. Okay. So it's four by five. The height is, four. later it becomes four by five. This is four by five. This is also yeah, yeah, four by five. If it was a fraction. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So I, all I have to do is I have to find one configuration where you first add here and then add here is different than when you add here and then add there. That's all. Okay, so I will take a graph like this. Um, let me put this. Con if we said if z is bigger than 3, so this is 2.5 and this is 2. And let us say all the neighbors are 1, 1. Please. Uh, can you please? Let us take this configuration. I just made it up right now. Consider a big lattice. And I construct this configuration where these heights are 2.5 and 2 and the neighbors are some 1.1, whatever you like. Now, first I add here an average over everything and then I add here an average over everything and then I do it in the reverse order you will not get the same value. Okay? And so then the model is not a median, end of proof. Yes? We take a model like this. Yeah. So we say, yes, we start with one, 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 two, two, one, one. Mm. So we decide to add one right here. Yes. So we go there. Yeah. And we take the sum of all yeah. them, divide mm. by five, mm. each mm. one of these, distribute yeah. itself, yeah. and we get this is stable. Yeah. So if we want to prove that it's not a billion, we then add. Yeah, you one. add it I and J. Yes. Okay. So construct. A C I J such that A I A J C is not equal to A J A I C. Once you have constructed one such counter example, then the result is not a billion. End of proof. Right? No, because we, in the proof of a billion, no, it is because you can start with this configuration and AI, AJ, C is not equal to AJ, AI, C. This we can construct. And then, but for a billion property, it has to be true for all configurations. So it's not true. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you can check. Again, you can construct this. Uh, yeah. Of course, it is different. The point was only to see that given the model, you can check does it have an abelian property or does it have a abelian property, full stop. It's more or less the definition of what is a billion property. But we are applying it to a context which was not really discussed in class. This will work. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. 
Sorry, can you repeat? No, no, no. I thought it is true for all configurations. That's what we proved. Okay? Yes, sir. Is it faster to say that we can define the inverse? No, no, no. It's too far. Inverse, we don't, the abelian property does not necessarily require an inverse to exist. Because sometimes we work in this extended space of configurations where heights can be negative and all kinds of stuff. Let us not go into the group, you know, of course, if they are all operators are commuting, then they will form a commutative group. If they don't commute, maybe they form a non-commutative group, what do I know? Yeah. I think it's more, uh, like having this relation for tapping, yeah. if I want to write the operator that do this, yeah. like the relation between operators, yeah. uh, how can I do it? Because it's, it's uh, all I can do for sure, given a configuration C, which is by definition set of ZIs, I know what is AIC is equal to ZI prime. This I can construct. So the operators are well constructed. You can check if they are commuting or not. No, 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 my question is, uh, how can I write the relation between operators? Like, because we have uh, AJ, huh? and then applying it five times, like having AJ, AJ. So, it's not clear that there is such a relation. Ah, okay, okay. Okay? okay. So it's not clear that there is such a relation. But this happens because we have a real number of cents of rates that we can have on each side, right? Because if I have integers, I can always write a relation between operators. No. Why not? Because the abelian property may not still hold. It may happen that, see, we, we said that ai to the power 4 is equal to ai1, ai2. That property also need not hold in general. Okay? I think these are all special cases. Okay, is this. Is this end of this discussion for this question? Yes, please. Yes. Huh. Necessary condition is just AI, AJ equal to AJ, AI. That is necessary and sufficient. To prove that thing, I want to find the necessary condition. No, no, no. So, I, I understand. A i a j equal to zero. Now you can deduce this from some other condition. Yeah. If that other condition uses the toppling rules in some way, then okay. I mean, you have shown that that particular toppling rule is commutative. Uh, do you want to prove that? Uh, sorry, just let me answer this one. So, let all possible, you know, you don't even tell me the toppling rule and you want to deduce this condition. So, toppling rule with toppling rule. With toppling rule. With toppling rule, you can just check. That's the thing. I mean, then you have to find some configuration, but then you have to do some algorithm from the toppling rule. Oh, sir, I don't know. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> no, no, no. These questions, they can be set in some more general setting and you can think about them. They are supposed to a check for comprehension and allow you to extrapolate further. We which we are not doing. Yes, please. There was another question here. Yes. Yes. Okay. No, they all become equal. That was the rule. All the heights become eleven by five. Even in the middle. Ah. Okay. Okay. So, people didn't even understand. See, I asked three times, have you understood the definition of the model? And people didn't understand. Okay. You, sir, is this uh, argument clear to you so far? Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, they, it's not a proof. It depends 
on how it depends on the neighbor, no? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm saying that without giving a toppling rule, you cannot give a proof that everything is a billion. There is a counter example. For some set of toppling rules, yes, they are a billion. Other set of toppling rules, they are not a billion. Yes, sir. When the system is finite? Sorry? When the system is finite and it's easy to write the relation between operators, like uh, toppling in one side or yeah. neighbor, mm. we, can, we can say that uh, once I found the identity operation of mm. the current state, then the system is a billion mm. for sure, right? Because I, I'm moving on a torus in ah. one direction or in another. Yeah. But there will be for sure the billion. I don't know if there is some identity operation which is a known trivial identity operation. You know, if you don't touch anything, then of course it remains unchanged. We are doing something, we say add the, all this stuff and then you relax again and you will still get back the same stuff. I don't know for an arbitrary toppling rules this result is true. Okay, yeah. Yes, that is what I want to do, but I'm sort of not being allowed. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, so, can we go on to the next question? Yes. Is like other sand pi models, such as the critical floor, where the condition inside it depends on the height of the other side. Approved, right? This is not a proof. This is a um, uh, reference to authority. Okay. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm asking for a proof, not saying in some textbook or the other this is written like that. Can you give the proof yourself? Yeah, but the idea is correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the is Sorry, statement there is correct. Looking for a counterexample, I already know it's not a billion. Ah, so, okay. Everybody is satisfied and happy. We can go to the next question. Okay. Uh, okay. So this one is still referring to my one of my first lectures. So I want to have a profile H of X. You know, this was this profile, like this mountain profile. And I want to construct H of X, H of X plus delta average value, actually I will write like this, h of x plus delta minus of h of x squared average goes like delta to the power y, for all y, for all delta. Okay. You cannot see, okay. Construct a profile H of X such that H of X, H of X plus R Let's write minus squared goes like R to the power y. So this was, you know, it was in the beginning we said that there is this mountain profile and if you calculate height difference at two sides, it goes like power y and uh, can you construct, uh, can you write a Monte Carlo program which will generate these height profiles? even y. I give you y, you generate a program and give me how to give the output. How to give the height yeah. It will give random height profile, but it will have this property that on the average h of x minus h of x plus r whole squared goes like r to the power y. The average, over average over, it's an ensemble average, but you, if it's a long <coughs> configuration, you can average over x. <laughs> Yes, please. 
It can be sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just song Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it should give him a random answer each time and the ensemble should have this property. Yes, that is the question. Has everybody understood the question? No, no, no. So I'm giving. Uh, The output of the program is a random profile which has this ensemble property. Oh. Okay. Can you generate a random profile which has this from this ensemble which has this average property? Okay. Yeah, H of I only give you Y for all R it should work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trial and error. Trial and error. I think that will be very tiring. Never you write a computer program, let the computer do the trial and error. Never, never. No, because I want one million outputs. And you are going to do trial and error, you will keep me waiting for very long. And that is, uh, I cannot afford that much time. Is the question clear? Hmm. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Next. <laughs> Anybody else has a better idea? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. For y equal to 0.7, can you work? Can, will your program work for y equal to 0.7? If it only adds incrementally, then some kind of central limit theorem usually works and it doesn't generate long range correlations of the type I'm looking for. Yes, there was some other question. Only one point. This is valid for all R. Yeah, so you do for, okay. Okay, yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Precisely. And that is the answer. Okay. So the answer is, you uh, see, all questions depend on some pre-knowledge. So I assume that you know this or you know this or you don't know this. And I also know that all of you actually don't end up knowing that prerequisite. But this is a test of that prerequisite. So it is well known that if you want to generate something like this, a random profile, the way to do it is like this. Um, Suppose there is an h of x, okay? Then you can generate h of x, h of x plus r, average. This is called c of r, define. We are giving you a particular form of c of r, but you can choose other forms if you like, okay? But then, how do you generate something with c of r? So it says that given c of r, Uh, define uh, C tilde of K is equal to C of R Fourier transform. C tilde of K is the power spectrum of the thing in the wave number K. 
So you take the signal, break it into Fourier mode, and the power in the kth mode is called E C tilde of k. Okay, and if uh, is equal to power in the kth mode. So then, uh, if I want to generate uh, h tilde of k is a random variable with variance c tilde of k. So you pick h tilde of k as a random variable, but its square average is c is C tilde of k. Then you get all the set of h tilde of k, then take Fourier transform, you get h of x. Because these numbers are random, you will get random answers each time, different answers. Uh, this f h now will be Gaussian random variables. Okay, so I didn't insist, but you know I just said make a construction which will give me this, and this one works. Uh, okay, so that's an example of such functions, and by you know because this c tilde of k can be chosen to be whatever I like, I can in this case. It is chosen to be 1 upon k to the power some number which depends on y. And then uh, when you took Fourier transform, this will give you some function and now you adjust the beta so that the variance comes out right. Okay? That step is not being done. here. But the point about the question is only this, that the answer is that you construct a function with a given, a given Fourier components and then add up the random components and then you get the full spectrum. And uh, the power of the um, kth mode is pre-specified. Yes. Yes, of course. Yes. So beta is also known. I didn't I didn't work out the relation between beta and gamma. That is left as an exercise. Okay? Yes, please. Huh. This depends, this is a translationally invariant system and it, it has a stationary Gaussian process. It's working. Yes, so I, uh, I, I didn't understand. Yes, yes. But, uh, why should we, uh, this, this is not, why should we Okay, so there is a well-known theorem which is called the wiener kinchin theorem. We say if you have a stationary process, then the Fourier transform of the correlation function is the power spectrum. So if I give you the correlation function, I'm giving you the power spectrum. If I'm giving you the power spectrum, you make a signal with that power and then Fourier transform it back and you get the answer. Huh. No, this is the expectation is in the so this wiener kinchin theorem is not known to everybody. Wiener kinchin theorem. It says for a stationary process, H of X, 
Fourier transform of correlation function. is equal to power spectrum. Okay? This was assumed to be known. Okay? So you know the power spectrum of a process, then you construct a random signal with that power. It means, it, it, it means quite is fixed, but the values need not be fixed. Then take Fourier transform and you get the random signal. <coughs> Sorry? Yes, average. Okay? Can I go to the next question? Yes. Ah, okay, so very good. Um, so, h x minus h of x plus r full squared average is equal to h squared average plus h of x plus r squared average minus h h 2. But this is equal to this. And it's independent of x because it's a translationally invariant process. And so it's just a number. So h h correlation function is equal to constant minus h minus h squared every. Okay? So it is, uh, yeah, up to an additive constant, these two are the same. Okay, next question. Uh, I will erase this part. It says show that for directed 2D ASM expectation value of S, I will, you know, is equal to um, constant times L. It's not goes as, it is equal to. Uh, let us define the model. So the model was defined like this. There was um, some square lattice with periodic boundary conditions. This length is L. This length is M. And when some particle leaves from here, it um, throws two particles down. Okay. And you add only at top, and leave at in mean, the particles leave at the bottom. And then the question is that what can you show that the average number of top links per particle added will be constant times L? So if we remember the proof, it said that on the average, you know, every particle will travel length L. But for a directed pile, every particle will actually travel exactly length L in order to leave. So the argument works without any mm, chain. Is this clear? Yeah, yeah, of course, it's expected value of S by definition is in the steady state. And you have a conservation of particles and then that's why And there is a conservation of particles. And the particles are added at top and they are removed at the bottom. Yeah. See, nothing, this proof does not in require anything beyond what you have already learned. But it might just require restructuring your thought a little bit to get the answer exactly right. Okay? Okay. Um, hmm. So, this one. 
find the steady state and probability of different configurations of a uh, two compartment plus engine train so to recall the train model was defined like this there is a train and uh, there is some spring in between and there is a compartment one and there is a spring and there is a compartment two and this engine moves at rate one every time step but if the string becomes of length more than two it becomes three then it resets to either length one or one two and it pulls everything behind so it just moves this compartment but then this spring will become longer and then maybe it will also reset and that compartment will jerk forward and uh, so then it stops at some stage and then the engine moves again and so on and so forth and the compartment behind keep on moving in jerky motion so then there is a steady state now the question is can you if i take the steady state and i look just before the engine has moved further after after the configuration has relaxed before the engine has moved one more step then what are the allowed configurations of the train there are different configurations and what are the probabilities of different configurations in the steady state <coughs> how many of you can do this problem nobody okay one two half hand okay okay no 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 so so firstly once everything is relaxed what are the lengths of springs they can be one or two that's what we said nothing else so a configuration is specified by l1 equal to 1 l2 equal to 1 or 2 so the uh, configuration is specified by l1 l2 which is the length of spring 1 length of spring 2 and the allowed configurations are 1 1 1 2 2 1 2 2 is this point clear now in the steady state these configurations will occur with different probabilities and we want to know what are the probabilities of these different configurations okay so how do i do this well i have to find what ha what happens if if the configuration now is 1 1 and the engine moves then what will happen to it 1 2 actually maybe i should write it like l2 l1 l1 is to the right and so it will become 1 2 because l1 will increase and the other configuration will remain there right this is all that will happen but suppose the configuration is 1 2 then what happens so it will become 1 3 but 1 3 has to reset so this will reset to 1 or 2 but depending on that value this next value will also change so 1 3 Once the engine moves further, will become what? <laughs> Very good. It goes to two one or one two. With what probabilities? Equal, we said with equal. This was our rule. With equal probability. This probability one by two. This is also probability one by two. what happens if the initial configuration is 2 1 and the engine moves to 2 what 
What happens if the initial configuration is to two and the engine moves? Ah, so very good. So the point is the engine will move, then the first spring will relax, and the second spring will also relax, and then you have different possible outcomes. So with some probability this will happen, with some probability this will happen, you know, there are probability, transition probabilities of different configurations. So you can write in the end that P11, P12, P21, P22 vector at time t plus 1 is equal to W times P11, P12, P21, P22 at time t. Then I know, yeah, just one second. Uh, I know the matrix W, I just worked it out. Then I find the largest eigenvector of this W, and that is the steady state. Yes, please. Can you say what happens when the other set? So one of the spring becomes uh, or the length 3? Yeah. And then it can become 2 or 1? With equal probability. With equal probability, and the other spring? No, so, it, so the relaxation occurs from the engine side. The first spring just changes and it pulls the compartment behind. <coughs> Once it pulls the compartment behind, then the next chain will become long, then it will pull the compartment behind and so on. That is the dynamics as defined. Okay? <coughs> so, the matrix W is a 4 by 4 matrix. So, it can be worked out without too much hassle. That's how you determine the steady state of this system. So, so yes. So this is just using the Markovianity of the process? Yes, of course. And uh, using the fact that W is just a Once you define the model, the matrix W is well defined. <coughs> okay? Yes. <coughs> yeah. Spring hmm. can be relaxed, don't you? Does it matter the order in this case? I guess so, but so in the definition of the model, we said that the first spring relaxes, then the next one relaxes, then the okay, third the one. First, uh, first. Yeah. Okay. That, that you know, you can ask what is the definition of the model, which order do springs relax, and so on. And so the answer is that it may happen that you know this spring relaxes, but then this one relaxes, this relaxes again. So we said, no, 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 start from the right end and then only propagate towards the left. Yes, please. Sorry? Yes. I hope so. No, no, no. I'm asking, is this fact well known to everybody that the steady state will be the largest, eigen, largest eigenvector of a Markov matrix? Yeah. At least some people know it. No, it is clearly not known to everybody. But I'm asking that. Uh, I, we actually use this property sometime, you know. We said that there is an evolution operator W, which we wrote down. W is this matrix. It's the probability evolution matrix. Yes, sir. The largest eigenvalue is 1 in this problem. Because the steady state, the vector doesn't change. All other vectors have eigenvalue less than 1. That is a general property of Markov processes. Okay? Yes, of course. This W evolves on, W gives you one step evolution in time, and then if you want 10 step evolution, you write W to the power 10. Value will be the raised to power 10, but 1 raised to the power 10 is still 1. All other numbers are smaller and they decrease. So, the proof is that if you write a Markov process in which there is the matrix W, then it has one eigenvalue at least which is 1, and all other eigenvalues have to have modulus less than or equal to 1. They cannot be bigger than 1, because if it's bigger than 1, you raise it to power 15, probabilities will become divergent, which is not allowed. So the Markov matrix cannot have eigenvalues with modulus bigger than 1. Okay? That 
depends on the details of the Markov matrix. So you simply end, you get one, 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 one. Yeah, so then it's a degenerate Markov matrix in which nothing evolves, it remains the stay put. Yeah. Then the steady state is not unique. If the eigenvalue of the Markov matrix 1 is not unique, if the eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue 1 is not unique, then the steady state is not unique. Okay? It's not ergodic. It's yeah, it is not ergodic. Okay? Can I ask a question about the previous exercise? Do we have to find C or do we have to prove uh, it is... Uh, you have to determine the eigenvector. That is what it says. Determine the probabilities of different configurations. No, no. Exercise with the previous seven. Do we have to find C? In a, in a question about the previous exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to find it. Hmm. It's a number. Hmm. Okay. What is it? I would say hmm? one. But... I would say half. Half. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. It, actually, I we gave the same. Point. Please remember, we gave the argument. Each particle, uh, of course, takes L steps. But when I ask how many toplings occur, in each toppling, two particles move. So there is a half. If you don't put down a half, you will not get full credit for some such question, clearly. Okay, yes. Yeah. I would only look for, if you have got the general idea, I will not look for a very uh, detailed and careful proof. So long as I see that you have got the idea, I will give you credit. Okay? This is a um, low test, low order test. In the sense, I'm not really distinguishing between a person who gets the Nobel Prize and the person who doesn't get the Nobel Prize. We are looking for people who pass the course and don't pass the course. So the threshold for checking is also lower. I will not ask very subtle questions. I will not ask, please, excuse me. When I talk, I prefer that other people don't talk. OK? So I'm saying that in the exam, we are not really, it's, it's not a very high grade exam. So we are only checking for basic understanding. Like, if I ask you this problem, if you somehow I, I'm able to convince myself that you understand what's the W matrix and you have tried to write it and you have tried to write the eigenvector, you made some mistake in the algebra of determining it, you will get partial credit. Clearly you will not get full credit, but a person who doesn't even recognize that this is a Markov process and there is a transition matrix, then of course that doesn't get any credit whatsoever. Okay? You are saying something? Casting my performance. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, <laughs> you will not. The bad one. Bad one, I see. Okay. I hope not. Uh, my attempt has been to make clear. Um, okay. Okay, so here is a, suppose I write this sand pile on a, four by L lattice. Okay, so the sides, are labeled, I guess, this one is called, uh, well, we will mm, count x this way. So this is called 1, 1, this is called 1, 2, this is called 1, 3, this is called 1, 4, this one is called 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4. Is this point clear? The coordinates are defined x this way and y this way. This is consistent with the way quantum mechanics is done and operators are written and so on and so forth. So, or Urdu or Arabic is written, right? So we count from right to left. 
And so there is an operator called A x y, or there is a set of operators called A x y. Hmm? And then there is this operator algebra we already wrote down. I don't know a to the power four is equal to a, 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 a with some indices below. Okay. So the question is uh, use the operator algebra to express a x y in terms of a x equal to 1 y. <laughs> Okay. Can one do this? A x y in terms of a, put x equal to one and y can take value one to four. So can you write a two one in terms of a one one, a one two, a one three, a one four? Nice. Yes. Nice. You think that's nice, but can you do it? Yeah. No. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm going for. <laughs> okay, so here is my problem. These operators can be expressed in terms of a11, a12, a13, a14. They are them. What about this one? A21. Well, I have an equation which says a11 to the power 4 is equal to a21, a12. Right? So I just invert it. I write a21 is equal to a11 to the power 4, a12 to the power minus 1. Yes. They are the addition operators, no? They are these matrices of size 4 to the power n by 4 to the power n. Actually, on the, uh, working on the recurrent set now. A operators are the operators which were defined in the first lecture, and they are the addition operators. They act on the space of configuration, give you a new configuration. But think of them as matrices, and then this equation holds a21 is equal to a11 to the power 4, a12 to the power minus 1. What is a22? One of you is brave enough to give the final answer. <laughs> hmm? Out and I will write a two two equal to a a two two to the power, two two to the power four. No, I want to write a two two in terms of other things. A a one one inverse. That's it. Change the order, but these commute. Ah. That sounds good to me. Is this clear? Okay. So I can write also a two three and a two four. They will also be some powers of a one one, a one two, a one three, a one four. 
once I have done this, then I can also write a three one one a three one y in terms of these powers. Okay, you always get integer powers of the basic operators, positive or negative. Okay. Okay. Hmm. I can do at least one more problem. Uh, okay. Then. So we said express a x y in terms of a x equal to one y. So it's clear they are just integer powers of it. So all these operators they are looking like many, but they are only expressed in terms of these four basic operators. Then you can ask further: Are these four operators the generators of the full group or not? So that question is a little bit, uh, you know, difficult to answer or not immediately clear. Not difficult to answer, not immediately clear. So that's not part of my question. The question stops here. If you recognize the basic operator satisfied by the algebra, basic equation satisfied by the operators. You write, you rearrange them in some way, you get the result. It's not a big deal. The only thing which is required is a little bit of ability to think about the problem directly. Okay. Question number 10 is like this. That I have a sand pile like this, um, which is uh, L by L, but L is big. Then I add at some site at the boundary. Ah, you cannot see anything. Add a particle at the boundary of a sand pile. So I will make the boundary like this. This is my pile and this is empty. So it is half space. X bigger than equal to zero. Okay. Now I add a particle at the origin here. A zero, okay, and then uh, you calculate how many toplings occur at distance r. Okay, I think we showed earlier that g of r, which is the number of toplings at r, went like one upon r to the power d minus two. Okay, uh, this was um, shown, and for Site adding site at the boundary. At boundary, G goes like one upon R to the power D minus one. So I'm just saying that I add a particle here. How many toplings will occur at a distance R? How does that vary with R? It varies with a different power than if this was in the bulk, if it was in the middle, not away from the boundary. So this power is changed from d minus 2 to d minus 1. And can we show that it goes as r to the power d minus 1? Okay. Now the proof will be, suppose you have a point charge. And I calculate the potential due to a point charge. 
potential due to a point charge in 2D goes like log r. But suppose the potential is near a conducting wall. Oh, sorry, suppose the charge is near a conducting wall. Then the corresponding potential uh, behaves differently. What is it? Okay. One over R. Okay. Does everybody agree? So, I think the only thing to realize is that we were doing the electrostatics problem all along. Nothing very profound. The propagator G is just the electrostatic potential. We did the resistor problem where we got some log R, no? We, we solve the Laplace's equation to get the potential. The Laplace's equation is the solution of an electrostatics problem. This is the discrete analog of the electrostatics problem. But there is there are still dipoles and the potential at large r will go like 1 by r in 2D, 1 by r squared in 3D. Multiplied by cos theta. There is an angle dependence also to the potential, right? Okay, mm, that's all there is. The, sorry, sorry, please, uh, one at a time, yeah. Hmm. Basic operators are the operators A. Then what? Of the group corresponding to the strip problem, not for the universe. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Can you repeat? Uh, it's kind of a general argument, not very. I general. didn't get it. No, that is why I'm asking you to repeat. Uh, if if we say that for two points, hmm. uh, the correlation <coughs> function is d, the power r, one over r to the t minus two, hmm. but we are uh, adding particles to the total whole boundary, hmm. and uh, it, you say like it's an infinite plane, right? Yeah. So we can say just can do like no, an so integration uh, on the on the on the boundary. Yeah. And, uh, since the boundary is a I cannot do that integral in my head. No, no, no. You can do the integral, but is it clear what is the answer of the integration? It's it will be something that hmm. is proportional hmm. to r to to the one over r to the d to d minus two hmm. times r. So but it is times 1 by r. It's not times r, it is times 1 by r. The answer, the first problem was log r, the new answer is 1 by r. If the potential dies faster, not slower. One upon r to the power d minus, in 3D, the ordinary potential goes like 1 by r. The potential near the conducting wall goes like 1 by r squared. It goes faster, goes down faster. Your integration would suggest the opposite. Ah, okay. Okay, no, no, but the argument is actually good. What you have to say is that if I want to solve the problem with phi equal to 0 on the um, some line, then there is an image method of images, you take a positive and you take the image charge which is negative and add them up and that gives you the dipole potential and dipole potential then is a 1 by r extra factor added. 
this argument is continuing to work for the discrete Laplace's problem. Can you give me the? Ah, the argument is that both of them satisfy the Laplace's equation with the point source. No, that is the end of the argument. It's a correct and rigorous argument. See, if there are two different problems, one is an electrostatics problem, one is a sand pile problem. What is the relation between these two problems? The pro connection is that they satisfy similar equations. So I already showed that the G function which I defined for my sand pile problem satisfies the Laplace's equation, Poisson equation. And so the other is problem is like a electrostatic problem of some sort. Suppose you are doing a real experiment with sand, then what do you expect? You know all the electrostatics, you have read all of Jackson, then what? It depends on how much you are able to connect different problems. Okay? So if I am an experimentalist, it is not an excuse. If you should be an experimentalist with some imagination and some head, then you are able to make the connection. I can see if I am putting a positive charge, there is hmm. some induction negative charge. Hmm. Positive charge, I can argue that the potential energy is smaller. So yeah. what is the argument? Ah, what is the, what is the mechanism? Yeah, very good. When I add a particle here, things leave, and then some toplings occur and things leave from here. So fewer toplings occur because particles leave. Okay? Is that clear? I think we should stop because uh, I'm getting tired. <laughs> okay.